Hello there, I'm Hannah Wise. This is CNN Money Switzerland and this is what everyone is talking about today. A sombre mood on opening in Wall Street as markets around the world tanked after a political spat between Saudi Arabia and Russia compounded coronavirus fears that have jittered markets for the last weeks. In London, the FTSE 100 saw its worst day since the 2008 financial crisis. In the US, losses on the S&P 500 triggered a key market circuit breaker which halted trading for 15 minutes. And with a flight to safety, the Swiss franc strengthened against the dollar. Let's kick off with a look at just what went down between Saudi Arabia and Russia. It's not looking pretty in the oil market with the coronavirus undermining demand for oil around the world, especially in China, and the two largest exporters, Saudi Arabia and Russia, with two differing views of how to solve it. This spilled out into the open Friday in Vienna at the so-called OPEC Plus meeting. Vladimir Putin and his energy minister, Alexander Novak, saying they don't want to cut oil anymore to prop up prices, which is giving more room for U.S. production, which hit a record 13 million barrels a day uh, here in the first quarter. Saudi Arabia went into that meeting in Vienna looking to take another 1.5 million barrels a day off the market to stabilize prices collectively for all 23 producers of the OPEC+. Plus. When Russia left the bargaining table, Saudi Arabia said they would regret this decision and come back in June looking for more cuts. But in the interim, Saudi Arabia is boosting production to above 10 million barrels a day and then went to the extraordinary measure of slashing prices by up to $7 a barrel and triggering a price war. U.S. shale producers, of course, will feel the heat of this slash in prices by Saudi Arabia after that rapid expansion over the next 10 years. But down the road here with the stock market correction and now the oil price collapse, we have to start thinking of a recession globally, a contraction as a result of the coronavirus and the responses that we're seeing from two major players in the oil market, Saudi Arabia and Russia. John Defterius, London. Well, let's get stuck into this. I'm delighted to welcome back Cornelia Meyer, energy expert and economist to the studio. Cornelia, haven't the Saudis shot themselves in the foot here? I mean, they wanted to prevent markets, well, oil markets, from, from, from losses. And that's exactly what they've created. No, it's not what they've created. They have tried very hard. You know, they have cre uh, OPEC with the Secretary General uh, Mohamed Barkindo have worked very hard to create this alliance called OPEC Plus, which is the OPEC countries and 10 um, allies led by Russia. And so far, they have been very good at balancing the market, taking out taking out barrel after barrel after barrel. Last December, they took out 2.1 million barrels. So now what happened is corona. Demand, you know, slumped. Demand, demand slumped. They wanted to actually have their meeting beginning of March earlier. Russia said no. Then when they had the meeting, they very aggressively, OPEC said, we will take 1.5 million barrels out of the way. And Russia said no. And Russia's reasoning is a bit different from Saudi's reasoning. Russia is a bit fed up with the West. You know, there are the sanctions. There is so the, the whole brouhaha about the, um, about the Nord Stream pipeline to Germany. So they're a bit fed up, so they walked away so from the So what's happening now? We've got both sides just stamping their feet? Essentially, that's what it is. And Saudi said, you know, we can only contain this, we can only balance the market by really going in aggressively. If nobody helps us, we can't take another 1.5 million barrels out just from ourselves. So if everybody floods the market, well, we'll flood the market too. Oddly enough, that might get the Russians back to the negotiating table. But it's a wee bit of a dangerous um, tactic in as much we saw that 2014. Yes, but in the meantime, I mean, this hasn't just affected oil markets. You've seen equities, you've seen treasuries. Analysts are calling this utter carnage, and that's what they've created here. It's not just what they created. It is also the coronavirus. You know, let's not forget it is also... Uh, Italy sealing off the northern part of their country. It is countries not allowing people from certain uh, countries in anymore. It is a lot of big events being cancelled or postponed. But this the hasn't helped. Health. 
this hasn't helped, but it's not the only it's not the only thing. It's just it's like the perfect storm. And where I want, would like to come back to is we saw something similar in the oil markets 2014 when Saudi just started pumping and everybody started pumping and everybody thought, oh, the oil price will go so low that the shale producers who need a higher mm -hmm. price because they have higher production costs um, will be driven out of the market. But they came back with a vengeance because they became more efficient. Well, indeed, I mean, the, the shale producers, for example, back in 2014, actually benefited from what happened. Are they go is anyone going to benefit from what's well, happening they, this time? They benefit. They didn't benefit in 2014. They benefited in 2016 when the oil price went up again. That's because they had become more efficient. They could produce even more at a lower price. So, yes, we, it will probably... The people who can become more efficient, it will benefit them. But in the meantime, it's carnage. And in the meantime, carnage is the right word. And in the meantime, it's also for the international oil companies. You know, they will not invest anymore in future production. And at some stage, we may have too, too little of the black stuff around. Well, let's talk about that in just a moment. Um, of course, everyone is concerned about what happens next. We spoke to the UN Conference on Trade and Development today for their thoughts. Take a listen. I think what's at stake is a, a lot of trouble. Um, we, uh, we were already worried at the end of last year about a slowdown. This is going to certainly push global growth into recessionary territory uh, with uh, very high levels of debt um, that have been accumulated since the financial crisis. There's a lot of vulnerability, particularly in developing countries, but also obviously in many developing countries, uh, developed countries. We've seen what's happened to markets today. Uh, so, so there's real concerns that that this could escalate into a more serious problem than, than we imagined a few months ago. In the report, you talk about a, a $2 trillion shortfall in global income. Uh, what's the likelihood of this scenario? Well, a $2 trillion outcome would be the worst case scenario. Uh, growth, the growth of the global economy uh, probably be, certainly below 1%, uh, between half a percent and 1%. Uh, we don't see that yet. Um, we do see a, a, a global growth rate um, around 2%, probably a little bit below, but that would be a, a trillion dollar loss compared with what people were expecting just a few months ago. So, so ev uh, e even at the uh, best case scenario means a huge hit to, to, global, to global income. And, and for many developing countries, where our concern is that that's going to sp spell a lot of trouble. What will be the tipping points here? Uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to say. Confidence is a big factor here. And confidence is a very unpredictable uh, variable in this story. A lot will depend upon how governments respond in terms of appropriate policy. Uh, so it's very difficult to say exactly what will tip a global economy from, from being in a difficult to, uh, situation into being an out and out global recession. It's clear that central bank uh, policies as they stand won't be enough here. You talk about more far-reaching measures if we're going to avert a bigger crisis. Can you give some examples of the policies you're talking about? Uh, governments need to spend money. I mean, fiscal active uh, fiscal measures are required. They need to be coordinated across the, the major economies. Um, the G20 needs to, to act in the way that it did back in 2009 after the global financial crisis with a, clearly a, a coordinated effort to ensure that the market stabilized and that, and that growth did not did not collapse. So, so I think a coordinated response is necessary. For many developing countries that are facing debt distress already, I think we're going to have to look at more radical solutions. The need for a moratorium on debt servicing in some countries uh, will, be, will, will also be necessary. And, and so there's a, there's a lot more, I think, that the international community can do to ensure that the, the, the consequences of this crisis are not, uh, are not devastating for, 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 for local communities in the South. How exposed is Switzerland? Switzerland is probably less exposed than, than many e economies. It has control over its own monetary policy, so it, it certainly has more room on the monetary, on the monetary front. But it's, it's obviously very closely connected with the European economy, and the European economy is likely to enter recession in, 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 the, in the coming months. So, so there will be certainly a very large hit to the Swiss economy on the, on the trade side. So, Cornelia... Recession. Do you agree? Is that what's next on the cards? 
that may very well be where we are headed. The OECD said prior to the Friday events that we would see 50% less global economic growth. And that it was already anemic. So it's very well possible that between all the supply chain woes, the lack of travel, the lack of tourism, and what's happening in the oil markets, we could very well be headed for a recession. And, and can OPEC get things back on track before well, that, before it, recession it really possibly depends. comes? It really depends. I think the Saudis will be ready to get back to the negotiating table, but everybody else. And, you know, fair enough, if you're Saudi Arabia, you can't... They took the brunt of all the cuts. They can't always take... They can take the majority, but they cannot take all of the cuts. That's not fair to them either. I heard a lot of uh, energy analysts didn't get much sleep last night. Did you? Uh, I got none, <laughs> and, and it, it was... But we knew when we, when we saw the, what unfolded on um, Friday evening, we knew that would, it would be a very bad weekend. But did you expect this? I did expect this, yes. I did expect it. What, what surprised me is when WTI very briefly went below $30. That's when even I, who's... I'm pretty sturdy in this, even I got some heart, heart palpitations. And are you expecting any more heart palpitations in the future? It, I mean... could, it could be, but when I looked at it, the session went down. Early Asian trading, it went down to under, under 30 for, for WTA, to 31, 32 for Brent. We are now back up at 36 and 32 for Brent and WTI, respectively. We've come up. So we need to see what happens tomorrow. But I think anybody who tells you they can tell you what's happening next... I wished I, I had their glasses or their perspective, their vision. Cornelia Meyer, thank you very much indeed. Well, of course, you can keep up to date with everything. If you want to get into, involved in today's news, you can check out our social media pages. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. Whatever your comment, it's always great to hear from you. And, of course, our website address is on your screen now, cnnmoney.ch, where you can catch up with all our coverage. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.